Welcome everybody, glad to see you here. So I just want to introduce Guy Claxton quickly. Um, many of you probably know his background. He has published many books. He has a master's from Cambridge and his doctorate is in neuroscience from Oxford. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning everybody. Uh, it's such an honor to be following Bella Kalik on the stage here both in terms of the quality of her work and her work with art in particular. Um, these are great inspirations for me. I always think it's important to have heroes, don't you? Like people who you admire, people who draw you forward, and the work of Benner and Art, as well as David Perkins and others, people uh, around this conference have been a major uh, support and stimulation for me. I was just saying to Benner, I'm really pleased that I didn't discover their work 20 years ago because I would have felt cheated. I would have felt that my life's work had already been done. But luckily, I didn't discover them till more recently, so I had to figure these things out for myself. So you will hear very strong resonances between what I want to say today and uh, those the majority of you who were here uh, listening to Benham. But uh, I think the message is strong enough and important enough uh, for us to be uh, willing to kind of hear it put in different kinds, of, different kinds of ways. So, I want to talk about what I am calling these days the learning power approach. It doesn't really matter uh, what you call it. Um, the important thing is that it's not another brand in the marketplace. I think, I don't know if I'm being too optimistic, but I think that many of us at this conference, many of the presenters, and from my discussions, many of the people here are sensing the development of a powerful new school of thought about teaching and learning, and the way to connect teaching and learning with a clear vision of the desirable outcomes of education. And that's a important, vital activity. As Benna said with her quote uh, at, at the end of her talk, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. We invent it through the next generation. And I think that's what we're doing now. What's been emerging over the last I don't know, 20, 30 years, you could say 100 years, uh, as becoming more powerful because more grounded in clear and detailed understandings of the mind, which have been improving at the level of theory, uh, which are now able to underpin practical shifts, as Benno was illustrating to us, in the way we design teaching and learning. So what I want to talk about is not my own little corner of this, but I want to try and explore what are the commonalities between, you would have a different list maybe, but my list of the people who have been contributing, like the tributary rivers, to what is now a major sea change in our thinking about teaching and learning. And these are some of the some of the kindred organizations. Michael Fullan's work on new pedagogies for deep learning, as he calls it, habits of mind, obviously, of Art and Benner. Ron Richard's cultures of thinking, Ron Berger's expeditionary learning. I showed a clip from one of the expeditionary learning schools uh, in my workshop yesterday. Our own work on building learning power. Uh, the work that's been going on, one of the original pioneering initiatives here is a project called the Peel Project, project for the enhancement of effective learning that has been going on at the University of Monash in Melbourne in Australia for 30 years now. The work that better referenced of the International Baccalaureate, which has been going for 50 years, built around a specification of what they call the learner profile, uh, and the desire to configure teaching so that the aspects, these strengths, are being encouraged. The OECD is a major player in building our understanding of what they call the new competences, 
that are being uh, required. And across the states and across the world, this work is being picked up and funded by organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the development of Angela Duckworth's Character Lab, um, and by the development of new curricula across a whole range of different national uh, jurisdictions, across uh, Finland, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, you will find attempts to specify the desirable outcomes of education. That's the phrase that the Ministry of Education in Singapore uses to describe with some accuracy the kind of young people that we want our schools to produce. Not only what they know, not only what their grades are, not only how successful they are being at accessing high quality tertiary or higher education. But what kinds of character, as Benno was talking about, do they come out with? And is that character suiting them, equipping them to meet the challenges not of the mid 20th century, which my education seemed to be aimed at, and which a lot of traditional good education is still aiming at, but to meet the new emerging demands of the 21st century. century. So I'm very excited. I think, like many of you, that this is an exciting and positive time to be alive in education, to be a teacher in our schools, despite the fact that there are also countervailing forces of rather unhappy uh, approaches, punitive approaches to teaching and learning, which, which specify increasing accountability, increasing testing, both of teachers and of young people. I sense that the tide is turning and that in many jurisdictions we are winning the battle. Not yet nationally in the USA, not conspicuously in my country of England, but in many countries around the world. One of the characteristics, I want to talk about the characteristics of this movement as I see it developing. I think one of the characteristics, one of the things that excites me a lot is not for the first time, because there have been many other approaches around that have been mentioned in this conference going back a long way to Dewey, Pestalozzi, who are the new schools in um, Reggio Emilia, initiatives like the Escuela Nueva uh, in South America, and so on. What is exciting is the binding more tightly together the vision, a clear vision for the desirable outcomes of education, or what I sometimes call the valuable residues of education. Somebody, I think maybe it was Einstein, when people can't remember who made a quotation, they always say it's Einstein. Or sometimes they say it was Winston Churchill in my country. Someone who said, your well, education is what remains after you have forgotten everything you learned at school. Right? It's the deeper characteristics that we're all interested in. A vision that extends the horizon of ambition for education beyond the obsession with test scores, grades, and college and university entrance, which genuinely looks at what are the demands of this new century, and how with a group of four-year-olds, or 11-year-olds, or 17-year-olds, we are not only endeavoring to equip them with the literacy, the numeracy, the test scores that they're going to need to get through important gateways in their lives, but we're working at a deeper level to give them what we believe will be of the best equipment to live a happy and fulfilled and responsible and communal life in the 21st century. Binding that vision together, so that vision then drives all our thinking about what happens in school. It drives our thinking about the curriculum. What are the structures and practices which support the development of those outcomes. How do we design the timetable? How long are our lessons going to be? 
how much we involve the students in taking responsibility for what happens in their schools. To what extent do we invite feedback from the students as a matter of policy on the teaching and learning that they are experiencing in our schools? Some schools are terrified of asking students their, their feedback, their impressions of the teaching that they're receiving for fear that if they just open this door an inch, a floodgate of disapproval and resentment will be unleashed on their schools. That doesn't happen. What happens if you ask a group of four-year-olds or 14-year-olds is that overwhelmingly you get mature, thoughtful, creative contributions how we can help our school become an ever more effective incubator of the skills, the knowledge, and the qualities that we know we are going to need in life. And then that drives a pedagogical style. There is a way of teaching which is more effective at building these character strengths or habits of mind or learning dispositions. And then there is an approach to assessment, which also contributes to driving the development of schools of that kind. Traditional forms of assessment often seem to be pulling schools in a way that is contradictory, like a different current, pulling us towards knowledge and testing and multiple choice questions, and not helping the endeavor of helping us give youngsters true education that they're going to need. In England we have a good expression, hopefully the, you have a version in Spanish, where we talk about the tail wags the dog. Not the dog wagging the tail, but the tail wags the dog. And we have to design forms of assessment so that the tail of assessment wags the dog of learning in the way that we want it to go and not in a contrary way. So many of these jurisdictions that have been designing curricula and developing new visions of what they, where they want to go are fighting a losing battle because they have not yet changed the assessment system. The assessment system is still the powerful driver of what parents value, what students value, and the way teachers teach in their schools. And then we need to be tying all that together with the kinds of leadership priorities and practices that school principals are showing. Leadership is not value-free. The way you lead a school depends on where you want the school to go. The kinds of cultural direction, the direction of evolution that you want the school to develop in. If you want a school to produce powerful learners, that's the phrase that I use. People who are not afraid of uncertainty, not afraid to ask for help, then obviously everybody in the school, from the principal upwards, downwards, and sideways, needs in their daily life to be modeling a person who is not afraid to ask for help, who is comfortable with uncertainty, who, is who uh, cheerfully admits their own uncertainties and their mistakes so that the school becomes a psychologically safe place for the students to admit those characteristics in themselves. If all you're interested in is your test scores and the number of your students who get to the University of Chile or the University of Cambridge, then your horizon is more limited than what you model walking the talk of being an open, non-defensive learner will not matter to you. You won't change the sign on your office door from school principal to lead learner, as many schools have. The job of the principal is to lead from the in front, lead from the front about what it means to be a learner. Many schools don't have that tightly knit. They don't have good knitting. They're not like the top piece of knitting in this picture. They're like the bottom bit of knitting. It's a mess of powerful personalities and the residue of other personalities and reacting to the latest government initiative. There isn't this strong sense of the direction that we're heading in and how everything lines up to 
support that direction. In the way that if you're an intelligent yachtsman or yachtswoman, you can, even, you can travel even against the wind if you're smart. You know how to harness the wind, help you get going where you need to go. But first, to be able to harness the wind, you need to know where you're going. You need to be making progress. And then all these things line up around you. Another characteristic, I think, is increasingly rigorous thinking about this journey, and about the, about the process of getting there, as well as being clear about where we want to go. We need to be very grown up, not romantic, not hopeful, not just using our favorite anecdote to convince other people that our school is a wonderful place. We need to be grown up and hard-nosed and clear about what it is that we're up to. So we need to be conscious and deliberate, explicit, as Benno was saying, about what are the valued outcomes. The students need to know them, their parents need to know them. Explicit and shared, particularly with the students, so the students have a feeling that, this is, that their education is being done with them not as it was traditionally done to them. You need to be part of the journey. I have a friend in the UK called Chris Watkins who says, we need to make sure that the students see themselves not as passengers on the, some kind of cruise liner of education, but as part of the crew on that ship. And increasingly, part of the officers on the ship, part of the people who are determining the direction. We need to use language that is accessible and appealing. It doesn't help our cause to use language when we're talking to parents and students that, that they find alienating. In English, there are lots of good ways of not using the word metacognition. You can talk about, as we are all doing, thinking about what you're doing, standing back, taking stock, noticing your assumptions. There are, you can get a long way without having to use the language, the language of self-regulation, the language of agency, which sounds new and interesting and grown up, but inhibits our ability to recruit the sympathy and the enthusiasm of the very people whose buy-in we need if this enterprise is going to be successful. We need to be precise and detailed, not vague good intentions. Lots of schools in my country, on, the, on their website, the home page of their website, talk some nonsense about helping all their students fulfill their potential. It means nothing. You have no idea what a child's potential is. Let me ask you, have you fulfilled your potential? Seriously, do you remember when it happened? What were you doing at the time? You say, that's it, I'm full now. Right? It's just coasting, or it's downhill all the way from here. No, our potential expands over life, doesn't it? Our potential, our horizon, our ambition expands and then our competence grows to meet it. You can't measure fulfilling potential. You can imagine a school principal reporting to their board but I'm sorry to report that only 43% of our school leavers managed to fulfill at least 75% of their potential this year. Right? It doesn't mean anything. We need to specify our vision in ways that enable our students and their parents to hold us accountable because they can know whether we're getting there or not. Right? We need to get more grown up. We need to become, become comprehensive and coherent, not just picking up some little bit like grit or resilience or growth mindset or self-esteem or critical thinking, not becoming fascinated with part of it, but having a clear sense of the whole of it. You know the old story about the blind men and the elephant. And one man got hold of the elephant's leg and said, oh, I know what elephants are like. They're like tree trunks. Someone else got hold of the elephant's ear and said, no, 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 they're not like tree trunks. They're like big palm leaves in a forest. They all got hold of part of the elephant and mistook it for 
the whole elephant. So we need to have a model like Habits of Mind, like Building Learning Power, like David Perkins and others, list of learning dispositions that reminds us of the big picture. We need to see this as developmental, not just ticking the box, not just saying kids can collaborate because I saw them do it once. So I tick the box says can collaborate. No, we're building dispositions, not just skills. Anna and our Costa and I wrote a little paper about two or three, two or three years ago now, Benna, which was called Hard Thinking About Soft Skills. Right? It's like we need to think all these things by the right names, not non-cognitive skills or soft skills, but character strengths, things that are positive, habits of mind, learning muscles we talk about. We need to see these things as a pervasive and cross-curricular. In many schools, there are little pockets of this kind of teaching going on, but they're not endemic, they're not public, they're not being spread, they're not talked about in staff meetings. And we need to be doing that. We need to see the process in the school of professional development as being a continual uplift of pedagogical practice for teachers, not just worrying about a teacher who gives us cause for concern, but creating a community of practice within which every teacher is thinking experimentally and imaginatively about their own practice, tinkering their way towards a pedagogy, a teaching style, in small ways that I was talking about in my workshop <coughs> yesterday, it becomes an ever more powerful incubator of the values that we said we wanted for our children. And we need to be finding ways to review and monitor our progress. Lots of teachers say, yes, we love the growth mindset. We are clear that we want our children to become more resilient. Up go the hands when you say, who's interested in children becoming more resilient? which in my definition means persisting intelligently for longer with things they find difficult. Right? Staying intelligently engaged with things they find difficult. And then I say, great, me too, like Christopher, do you? So do I. So what are you doing in your school to satisfy yourselves that your sixth grade kids are indeed persisting longer with difficult things intelligently than they were in fifth grade. And then they go a bit quiet, because they haven't faced that question yet. They haven't been grown up enough. They're not following through on the promise. At some point, many people sign up to these values, but it fizzles out. They lose heart, or they lose focus as the busyness of being in a school develops. So, this is the way I describe the vision. Other people put it slightly differently. To develop all students as confident learners, ready, willing, and able to do what? Choose, design, research, pursue, troubleshoot, and review learning for themselves. To do that by themselves and with others. Do it to take advantage of the power of the group. For them to do that. Do it both in school and beyond, because the purpose of education is not to consume more education. The purpose of education is to find your passion, to make money for yourself and your family, to co contribute to your community. So just passing tests won't do it. In order to raise school achievement and life fulfillment, to do both those things at once. In my country, there are still people who are trying to argue that building character strengths or habits of mind is somehow in conflict, that there's some tug of war that goes on between rigor and knowledge and factual education. The main proponent of this mistaken view in the US is a man called E.D. Hirsch, who says you can't do it because there's no such thing as generic ways of thinking. And Benna and Art and others have quite clearly proven that otherwise. We need to be aiming at both those outcomes. So what our job is as teachers, every day, every lesson, every week, every month, every semester, every year, to be thinking about how can I teach in a way that systematically 
demonstrably, explicitly transfers more and more from myself to my students the power to teach themselves, become more and more independent of me. In a good old-fashioned school, I don't think any teacher wakes up in the morning and says to themselves, yippee, another day's opportunity to help my students become more passive, more docile, more only worried about the test scores, more frightened of making mistakes, less adventurous. I don't think anybody went into education to have that effect. You? But a lot of us did. When I was a teacher, as I look back now, with a degree of shame would be putting it too strongly, but regret, I could see that I was doing too much for my students in the interests of getting the test scores. I was over-teaching, over-prompting, over-organizing, over-rescuing, over-evaluating, in other words, systematically designing the culture of my, craft, my classroom to exclude opportunities for them to learn how to do these things for themselves. That's not a good preparation for life, is it? So the, the search is on for ways of doing this, hitting both these targets. And that means we have to be willing and interested in how slowly, gradually, progressively we share control with our students of what's going on in our classroom. It is part of our joy and our professional commitment to see our students doing things for themselves, by themselves, without our help, rejecting our help, looking it up and saying, I haven't got it yet, miss, but we're really having a good go, give us another 10 minutes because we think we can figure this out for ourselves. That's the spirit that will prepare youngsters better. Why? Because we won't always be there. Nobody, certainly in my country, maybe in the USA or Paraguay, it's different. But in my country, we don't, we're not, when we're grown up, we don't have assigned to us a guardian angel, a guardian teacher who follows us around for the rest of our lives, telling us what we need to do to close the gap between our current performance and how to hit the target. We're gonna to have to do that for ourselves, aren't we? As we grow up. Because we know that college demands learning power. We know from experience in the States as well as elsewhere that you can hothouse poor kids to get the grades to get them to college. Poor, poor kids to college was the drive. And then we discovered that for many of those poor kids, they got the grades, we were able to get them the grades, to squeeze the grades out of them, and then we were rather disappointed to discover that 70% of them dropped out of college in the first year, because they didn't have the resilience and the resourcefulness to manage on their own, do it when they weren't surrounded by those caring teachers. Because employers want learning agility, was run up a little while ago by the head of learning at Google, who had discovered, had found out about learning power and wanted, he said, your learning power sounds rather similar to our, what we call learning agility. Let's have a conversation about it. Actually, he was from Finland. I don't know why I had to do that in an American accent. <laughs> because life is tricky. There are all kinds of ways of expanding on that. Life has always been tricky. In the 21st century, it's very tricky. So we're going to need to be good learners because the results go up when we do it. What do, what do we mean? This is very similar to what Ben has said. What do we mean by being a good learner? Someone who does not shrink away from the unknown or reduce its complexity to fit their preconceptions. Unfortunately, there are people around the world, leaders of great nations in positions of extraordinary power at the moment, who do not know how not to shrink away from the unknown and who are constantly shrinking their understanding to 
that fit the limits of their own thought processes. They are dangerous as a result. People who are, we need people who are confident and capable in the face of difficulty, novelty, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, surprise, and disappointment. What we're doing at school is preparing young people, exactly as Ben was saying, to be good when they can't find their keys, to be good when they miss the train, to be good when they're lost, to be good when they encounter people in situations that are unfamiliar or very different. To be good, I was talking to someone from Puerto Rico a couple, of, a couple of days ago, to be good when your house is blown down by a hurricane. How can you be a good community leader in that situation? To be good when, you, when there's a power outage, to be good when you can't do your maths homework, to be good when you don't understand what someone else is saying. So to be a powerful learner, to have that independence and that confidence, what do you need? You need a store of rich, well-integrated and flexible knowledge and experience. Rich, well-integrated, deeply understood and flexible are not automatic outcomes of traditional education. You can be, acquire knowledge for the purpose of passing a test, and that does not mean, that does not signify that the knowledge that you have will help you out in a sticky situation. David Perkins often talks about what he calls the Ohm's Law man. People who really understand things in a way that enables them to function better in life, rather than just to turn a handle and do a little calculation in order to get a good mark on a test. We need to develop a repertoire of strategies and skills. David talked about this in his opening uh, keynote to this conference. Some people have been referred to, I quite like the expression, as mindware upgrades. Strategies that automatically click in to supplement, to improve. It's like going from, you know, uh, Word 1.0 to Word whatever it is now going from Windows 1 to Windows 10, constantly adding upgrades to our own ability to think. And we need those supporting attitudes, values and inclinations. And this is what many of us at this conference have realized and discovered, that thinking is not just a technical matter, it's a matter of personality also. To be a good thinker needs to have the disposition to be empathic take one of Benner's examples. So here, these are some of the key, everybody has their own little list. In an opera by Gilbert and Sullivan called The Mikado, there's a song about, I've got a little list, I've got a little list. Nobody will be missed on my little list. We all have our little list. Benner and Art have their list, I have my list, other people have their, have their list. Some of, the, some of the, the characteristics that emerge again and again, inquisitive, determined, focused and concentrated, proactive and resourceful, independent, collaborative, imaginative, critical, creative, analytical, systemic in their ability to think. What Helen Mary Imordino Yang demonstrated for me brilliantly was systemic thinking. The kind of thinking that is able to what she showed to us in her keynote yesterday morning is the ability to move effortlessly between tiny structures of neural behavior and high level factors to do with culture and society. It's thrilling when you see that kind of thinking being demonstrated to you and that's what we want youngsters, the future leaders, to be able to do uh, better and better. If we need any convincing, we know from the research of James Heckman uh, and his colleagues at the University of Chicago, James Heckman is a Nobel Prize winning economist. What that means is that without any doubt, he's very good with highly complex and elaborate data sets. That's what being an economist means. And a lot of his work has been on looking, finding this correlations between the habits of mind of an 11-year-old and how happy, how successful, indexed in all kinds of socio-economic ways, that person is in their life, with their life, when they're 40 or 50 years old. 
What are the long-term predictors of how well people are functioning in life? And it's things like our, our old friends, perseverance, self-control, control of attention, resilience to adversity, openness to experience, empathy, tolerance of diverse experiences. All of these predict how well you're doing when you're 50. Whether you've been in prison or not, whether your kids are in trouble with the law, your annual income, whether you're in a stable relationship, whether you own your own house, these hard-nosed facts are predicted not by your test scores, not by whether you got to Harvard as opposed to your local liberal arts college, but by whether you have these qualities of character. These are not nebulous, fluffy, new agey, nice-to-haves. These are what sits at the core of a well-lived life. Someone shocked me a little while ago by saying that they thought the purpose of education was to help you to be able to face your own death without regret. How's that for an ambition? And the, we, there is research on this. It shows that 90% of the things that people regret when they are coming to the end of their lives is not what they did, it's what they didn't do. What they didn't have the courage, the perception, self-confidence to embrace. So there are all kinds of good reasons why we're building these characteristics. Okay, so doing the knitting that we need to do, this is just an example. It's like this is a work in progress, but this is the kind of thinking that us people in this room are doing the hard thinking that we need to be doing. So let's take those characteristics of the powerful learner or the intelligent problem solver knows what to do when they don't know what to do, as Benno was saying. Their ability to choose, research, pursue, troubleshoot, review, and adjust learning on their own and with others in school and beyond. And let's think about what are the what are the characteristics, what's the equipment that they need in order to be good at choosing learning for themselves? Well, they need to be curious. They need to be open-minded. They need to be able to take control and have initiative. They need to have the self-awareness to know what it is that they're not good at, which they need to learn. So we can begin to create a chain of reasoning from the desirable outcomes to, so how do we grow it then? Right? Well, obviously, you don't develop your ability to choose learning by being in a classroom with a teacher who never gives you the opportunity to choose your learning. Right? This is not rocket science, is it? Like I'm told George Bush once said, talking about the people who worked at Cape Canaveral, he said, well, it's not rocket science. <laughs> so, you know, it's like once you begin to open up these chains of thought, they suggest answers, they suggest their own, art, their own answers. The research, to be a good researcher, well what do you need to be a good researcher? Well, you need to be, you need to have some of those habits of mind. You need to be investigating and inquiring and collecting information with all your senses. You need to be good at curating and collating and critiquing that information. The way Benno was talking about how you design your own portfolio, for example. So, how do we help kids get good at those things? Well, we might want to organize our classrooms around self-organizing learning environments. There are environments that Sugata Mitra has developed. Four or five kids with a single internet-enabled device and a burning question. Give them an hour under those circumstances and see what they can find out for themselves. You'll be thrilled, you'll have a class of seven-year-olds who are discovering more about brain surgery than you ever thought that they were capable of. Just look at the example of Christopher, I don't know if he's still here. It's like every nine-year-old has that capacity. He's not extraordinary. Or he is extraordinary only in the sense that his, oh, I nearly said he's fulfilled his potential. <laughs> he's expressing his potential, he's discovering his potential, He's exploding his potential. 
He's nowhere near fulfilled it yet. Right? But he's expanding in those capacities. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but you get the idea. This is doing the knitting. This is getting a sense of what kind of experience are we designing for our children, which have the express purpose of driving the development of the knowledge, the skills, the techniques, and the attitudes that we said we thought they needed. Now, some of these shifts are tectonic. I didn't have a chance to give the translators my slides ahead of time. Even if I had, the word tectonic did not appear. But is there a good Spanish word for tectonic? Okay, they're happy with that. Good, it's a good Latin or Greek word, so I'm sure you have a good translation. Tectonicos or something like that. Some of these changes are more revolutionary. Right? Like to become high-tech high, it's like most schools couldn't imagine being high-tech high yet. Right? Uh, extended, really well-designed project work where you have groups of kids for a month at a time working on something that's really difficult and that matters to people in their community. That's a very powerful way of designing learning that drives the development of research skills, perseverance, collaboration, and so on. Right? But a lot of schools don't have the luxury to do that, or they're within jurisdictions that don't give them the freedom, or they have assessment systems that make them believe that they need to have a more driven, a more content-focused <coughs> approach to their education. So, yes, we want to be looking for those big shifts, even changing in many of the schools that I work with now, the, the teachers have looked at things like the structure of the timetable and the length of the lesson. There are still schools in the UK, I can't believe I'm saying this, which the average, the length, the standard length of a lesson is 35 minutes. More common to have 50 minutes, sometimes an hour. In your school, do you, is, is, is the basic unit of time two hours? it is in many of many schools that I work with. Because the kind of learning that you can do in two hours is different from the kind of learning that you can do when you have to be sat down, got your books out, paying attention to the front, packing up and reviewing, and you've got to do all of that in 45 minutes. Right? So there are implications, there are structural implications of this way of thinking about how we design things that are matters of school policy, or maybe the local superintendent, or national policy, are being impacted on by a grown-up way of designing education that knits it closely to a clear, well-thought-out set of ideas about what the desirable changes are. But in many places, we need more small-scale. We need a good answer to the teacher who says, that's all very well, but I can't change the world. So what am I going to do differently on Monday? I like the phrase, there's a famous English poet called uh, William Blake, who talked about the importance of the minute particulars, paying attention to the minute particulars, to see the universe in a grain of sand was one of his poems. And we need to be paying attention to the minute particulars, the little details of the way we design our classrooms without even noticing sometimes. And that was what my workshop yesterday was looking at some of the minute particulars, things that any teacher could do next week to help to create these little shifts, change the mood in a classroom from education is something that's done to me, to education is something that I am being helped to learn how to design for myself. So we need to be looking to how to create gentle paths and slopes, evolutionary, not just revolutionary, but evolutionary tra trajectories that help teachers say, oh, I see, that's what you're talking about. Oh, I could try that. I could do that with my kids. Right? And we all need that. Right? Then, after a while, we can become more generative. You get the idea, you get the hang of it. 
you understand the principles behind what you're doing. But we all need some help. You know, teachers don't have PhDs in neuroscience or, or learning theory or whatever it might be. It's like you're busy working in the classroom. So there need to be stronger alliances, um, professional development alliances. So I wanted to uh, just give you another image which I find helpful about thinking about the relationship between the different kinds of learning that could be going on in a, a classroom simultaneously all the time. Remember that tug of war image which says you can't do building habits of mind because that's going to distract from learning about the Civil War or the periodic table. That mistaken idea that there's some competition between attention to the process of learning and securing the development of knowledge, of accurate knowledge. But I don't think that's the right image. I have the image of a river and that in different layers in the river, water flows differently. But, it's, but they're all flowing at the same time. Actually, a friend of mine drew this image. I don't know in other parts of the world whether you have a dessert that we have in English. It's called a trifle. Someone said this looks more like a trifle. And, uh, it's like it's a, it's a dessert that has lots of layers. It has, if you're lucky, it has alcohol at the bottom. <laughs> nice sponges, and then it has some custard, and then it has some cream, and then it has some nuts and strawberries on the top. This is supposed to be a river rather than a trifle, but if you like the trifle, you can have the trifle. So on the surface of the river, there's the content, the subject matter, floating by relatively rapidly and easy to see. And there goes ionic and covalent bonding. There goes the American Civil War. Ah, here comes some advanced grammatical construction in Spanish. All right, now we're going to do religious festivals across the world, right? The, the business of school. Easy to see, easy to talk about, easy to assess. Just below the surface are the skills, techniques, the forms of expertise and literacy which enable students to access and manipulate that knowledge. Right? And we're reasonably good at helping kids develop those forms of literacy, those forms of expertise as well. And what we're talking about here is what goes on down at the bottom of the river. It's darker down there. It's harder to see. And things change more slowly. Water flows more slowly down at the bottom of the river. But down at the bottom of the river of learning is where these underlying habits, positive learning dispositions, the habits of mind, the character strength, being shaped little by little, day in, day out, for good or ill. And every teacher is always affecting what's going on in children's minds at all of those levels, all the time. Character education is not something we add on. It's not a new thing. It's becoming more conscious about what is already going on down at the bottom of the river. Are we, without meaning to, steering our kids in the direction of becoming more independent, more curious, having more initiative, learning how to research things for themselves? Or are we, in the interests of efficiency, steering them in the direction of becoming more passive, more compliant, or sitting there passively waiting to be rescued and told the answer without it attending to and without meaning to. So the process of infusing concern with these habits of mind is not doing something new. It's maybe just taking an honest look at what's happening at that level and making sure that it's lined up, making sure that we're knitted what's going on down at these lower levels with what we want to be going on. Now, the aspects of what makes a good teacher, which are particularly potent at those three levels, are different. Not that we have to throw any of them away, 
just that we have to be aware that we're playing with the full deck. We have the full range. We're using all the tools at our disposal as teachers to have maximum impact at all of those levels. So to be a good old-fashioned teacher is good at the level of knowledge transmission and comprehension. We need to be secure in our knowledge. We need to explain things clearly. We need to mark work accurately. We need to give good feedback. Of course we do. At the level of building competence, developing those skills and those expertise, <clears throat> we need to be designing good training activities that stretch and strengthen those skills and those capacities. The nature of the activities we design becomes critical. But down at the level, the bottom of the river, a level where those attitudes to learning, those learning aptitudes are being shaped, other factors come into play which are to do with more the whole design of the experience of being in my lessons. And you can play with what's going on at those three different levels all the time. So you can teach the American Civil War the level of content, the stuff that's floating on, along on the surface of the river, in a good old, not a, not a good, a good actually, in a bad old-fashioned way, where you have the kids, they walk in, and you've projected on the whiteboard in your classroom an enormous page of notes that they have to transcribe as quickly and as accurately as they can from the board into their notebooks. That's a very good exercise for strengthening the skill of transcription. Right? It's not a life skill that would be at the top of my list, to be honest. Right? But in the old days, we spent a lot of time encouraging kids to become good transcribers. But we didn't, because we hadn't thought about it. If we get them to read pages of the textbook and answer multiple choice questions, on our factual understanding. And if we give kids no invitation, no opportunity to question the textbook, to ask whether it is full and accurate, whether any historical account could ever be full and accurate, if we never raise those questions, we're encouraging them to develop an attitude of credulity, of uncritical acceptance of whatever they read, aren't we? That's not a good thing for people to have in the days of the internet. In the days of the internet, I want my daughter, he's hypothetical, I don't have her, but let's say, I want my daughter, when she's online, to have a good, skeptical, critical attitude which says, how do I know this is true? How could I check on this? Don't you think? Who, how can I tell that this person who I'm chatting to online is who they say they are? I think those are important life skills in the 21st century, don't you? So I want my history teacher to be using the history textbook as an exercise machine for developing not credulity, but criticality. Developing a healthy, skeptical attitude. And you could do that once you've realized that that's a possibility. You can have kids getting together in pairs read a few pages of their history textbook in order to try and see what can we say about the cultural perspective of the textbook writer, couldn't we? Any average group of 12-year-olds can engage with that task and can be good at it, right? This, so we're steering something different. If they're still learning about the Civil War, right, but we're up and down at the bottom of the river, something different is happening. And as we become more conscious of these things, we steer our teaching in that direction. So, down at layer three, at the bottom of the river, it's the culture that counts. The development of learning dispositions, we now have to become aware of all these different aspects of what's going on in our classrooms. What are the explicit expectations and ground rules? What are our students understanding of what they're there for? goes around here. When some, one of our classmates volunteers an answer that is incorrect, is it funny for us to roll our eyes and groan out loud a 
make some rude remark about how thick they are, how dumb they are. If I, as a teacher, let that go unquestioned, I am allowing an atmosphere of psychological unsafety to develop in my classroom. So I pounce on that, I jump on that, every time. Zero tolerance. Not because I'm a nice person, but because I want to create my classroom as the most powerful place to be a learner that it can be. To be a learner means being vulnerable, means being willing to not know, to say things that are wrong, to not get it right first time, doesn't it? Obviously. We need to be thinking about the design of our activities, not just to get the knowledge, but to drive the development of the right attitudes. We need to think about who talks to whom and about what. Lots of talk between the students, not just from me to you, not like what what these conference presentations are like, but lots of lateral talk. What kind of language are we using? We, does our language invite imagination, invite critique, invite curiosity? The very way we talk, when we put a picture on the board, do we say, let's wonder about what might be happening in this picture? That, in, that language invites playfulness invites critique, invites exploration of possibilities. If I put a picture on the board and say, tell me what's going on here, that closes down that imagination. It, it suggests that there's a right answer. There are things that the students should be noticing, which the teacher already has in her mind. These little things, these minute particulars matter enormously down at level three. What we model, how we lay out the furniture creates different expectations. It makes it easier or harder for the students to engage in high quality exploratory talk. How we structure time, who gets to decide what in the classroom. All of these aspects impact on whether we are incubating passivity, docility, and a concern with right answers, or whether we're breeding 21st century leaders, 21st century thinkers. So the, the expectation for us is to become more conscious, more deliberate, more creative, so that we are expanding our repertoire of strategies and activities as teachers, so that what we do, every little thing that we do in our classroom, contributes we can see the rationale that links whether we encourage our students to use erasers or not. You can see the little thread that connects that decision, whether we want them to become resilient and independent learners who are not afraid of making mistakes in the big wide world. And if we do that, and if you read the right books, like this one, like David Perkins' books, here comes the commercial, by better and arts books, there's plenty of information around. Someone's once said the problem is not that we don't know what to do, it's that we don't do what we know. So there's lots in this new school of thought, there is lots of information and ideas and rigorous underpinnings for these ways of thinking about teaching. So now we need to go forth and embed those in our practice in schools so that our kids not only do well on the tests, but when they're 40 or 50 years old, they still have that inquisitive, imaginative sense of responsibility. They are truly powerful, lifelong, 21st century learners. Thank you very much.